a welcome to the students and not to the hell of machine learning, but to a nice reading of machine learning. We wish you, we, the group, the technical assistants and the lecturers, wish, wish you a happy new year and a successful year. Um, again, as always, you can interrupt us, you can type into the chat, we will look at the chat and if you have questions, we can directly answer them. What is foreseen for today? We will do a short recap of neural networks. In particular, Michael and me have completely reworked the multi-layer perceptron material, making a nice script from this. I will guide you through the script within the next 20 minutes. And this helps you a lot to do the self-study and this goes uh, in our technology and our writing and our way how we formalize this in the same direction as the writing before. And you can use this to develop your own neural networks. The formalisms which are presented are complete and in that sense, some slides are a bit full of formula. Don't worry about this. We do not ask you to recap or represent this formula, but you should get a feeling that you have seen now everything and that you are able to implement all the things by yourself. Moreover, we think that if we bring it down to the basic mathematics, you will get a deeper understanding of how things work and that there's no piece of magic left over. This recap of neural networks will take about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then Martin will take over and start a new chapter, namely the very important decision trees. Decision trees play a big role and um, they are able to generate nonlinear decision boundaries. They are able to work with symbolic data. They are able to combine few data, mass data. They are very flexible. And uh, there was a time there were, where these decision trees were really underestimated, but they gained a lot of popularity again, also because of decision forests and the modern stuff. Martin will start into this and the decision tree the um, lecture will start today and will be continued next week. Okay, then uh, I will start over. We have seen this very simple neural model and um, please keep in mind, this is a strong simplification of the reality. The computation in this perception, the mathematical computation happens exactly like uh, shown here. Um, we have an input vector, which you see here. And this input vector is multiplied with a weight vector. This gives a scalar product. And here you see the scalar product. And the result of the scalar product is um, requested or compared to um, whether it's zero, larger than zero or smaller than zero. And we do this here with a heavy side function. As an aside, the difference of the heavy side function and the sine function is that the heavy side function, in fact, has a zero, the value 0 0.5 at, at zero. But uh, you can also think simply of the sine function here. The algorithm which does the learning is a very basic algorithm, um, but it, is, it manages to do the separation. And compared to the least mean square algorithm, we have here the so-called heavy side function, kind of sine function. I have illustrated this algorithm here. Perhaps you recall this illustration. And um, what we want you to recall here is that this distinction, namely moving this line somewhere from left to right, is only done in the input space. The input, input space is the space of the features which you see here. It means we do not a kind of regression. We ask an example, are you on the wrong side or not? And if it's on the wrong side, this is called the idea of Fabian learning. If it is on the wrong side, we adapt somehow uh, this, uh, this vector. This, uh, and then with the weight vector and with this is a decision boundary. With this very simple algorithm, we have asked ourselves what can be decided. And there is a famous perceptron convergence theorem. If the data is linearly separable, then we will find the separated hyperplane.
if the data is not linearly separable, you see this here on the right hand side, the algorithm cannot find a solution. It uh, stops somewhere or it does not stop at all. Now comes a new thing into the game, namely, we do not only consider the input space, we also consider the gradient, that means the distance from points from this line. It's not directly the gradient, let's first think about this distance. If you see this illustration here, we have the decision boundary and the yellow plane here is a function which we want to regress. This function does this regression in a more or less good way. You see this distance here, this is measured. And if we place the function in a different place, we get different values for these distances. And the optimization now happens by minimizing these distances all together. That means we look at all examples and ask ourselves, what is the place of this line such that these distances are small? And if we can model these distances as a function, which we call loss function, we could optimize this problem by going to that position of the loss function where it is minimum. And this is called gradient descent because we move down the gradient of the loss function. This is only an illustration. I think more is interesting is this here. Each vector weight vector, that means each hypothesis can, can, can be seen as a point or is represented by a point here in the space of possible vectors, hypothesis space. And if we, for instance, the first time by random select a certain point, we can ask ourselves what we have to pay here what the loss is. And if we do this for all points, we, give such, uh, we get such a curve and we can move down this curve to the minimum. All we have to do is to take the loss and compute its derivative. The derivative, in fact, is a gradient. And this is exactly the line in the algorithm, which uh, we have written there. And this is what we compute. The derivation of this delta w is shown in the next slides, but I can skip this. It's uh, not too complicated. You should see that you can also compute it by yourself. If we take now a loss function, which simply counts the number of misclassified examples, the so-called zero one loss. This is different than measuring the distance. You see here, we look as completely misclassified or not. 
the lost surface cannot be treated effectively with our algorithms. You see, it is not possible to learn from the derivations where to go. One of the best solutions, it means gradient solutions and loss solutions, which you can apply is a so-called logistic regression. We had this already with a logistic loss and ideally with a regularization. Here is the derivation of this. And this is a line which is put into the algorithm. That means what you have seen here is that gradient descent helps us out in this situation. Gradient descent can be done with different loss functions. The quadratic loss is was shown here. The IO loss does not work. And one of the best losses is a logistic loss combined with a logistic regression. We then started, and this is a rather new part for today, with a multi-layer perceptron, which can do much more complicated things. All decision boundaries, which we built with gradient descent before, which we have seen, are linear. So multi-layer perceptron can overcome this, and it is one of the most powerful decision algorithms which we have at hand. Here, a short recap of the linear separability problem. You will notice already this is a recap. And I now start with uh, examples to explain how to overcome this. This is a XOR problem or XOR problem where we are giving four examples here. And we ask ourselves how to separate the two classes which we get by applying the XOR function. We have the class minus and the class plus. And if we arrange them here, you see on the right hand side that we cannot separate them with a single straight line. Actually, we need two lines. A single perceptron generates one line. This perceptron, which you see here, it's a minimum multi-layer perceptron that is able to handle the problem, generates two lines. This is also a solution to this problem if you would have the best weights or weights at all that can deal with this. Before I explain how we get these weights, I explain why this works so nice if we have already weights. For this purpose, I consider this perceptron here and its three weights, which we get here from the input lines. If we now take an input vector and multiply this as a scalar product with this weight set here, we get a decision boundary which is shown here. It means x3 is, for instance, positive, and x1, x2, and x4 are negative. If you take another line with this weights, and for this I apply another perceptron, we get this classification. X3, X4, X1 are positive, X2 is negative. And now the idea comes. 
If we now take this classification information as features, that means the classification information of this line and the classification information of this line, then we go one level higher in the so-called feature space. Recall, X3 was classified positive under this line and classified positive under this line, it gets a 1.1. X4 was classified zero here, one here, it gets a zero one. And X2 was always classified negative. And if we now take these values as new features, we get something like this. We get exactly this. You see, X1 and X2 are shown here with 0, 1. X2 with 0, 0, you see this here, and X3 with 1, 1. And the nice thing is here that we now can draw a line in this higher space. The perceptron computes here the new feature space. And these can be combined in output layer so that we can draw this line. And I present this in detail here. So because this is a basic principle in going for going in higher dimensions. This is a basic principle of learning networks and of deep networks. And you have to understand this, what's happening here. And you have to understand the problem, namely to find strong weights or weights that behave the way we want to have this. And all research about neural networks is about finding these weights. In the history, it was very clear that this problem could not be solved with a perceptron. And um, Marvin Minsky made a joke out of this. And since he was such a strong and famous and authoritative researcher, the people stopped doing research. And only by 1986, the first presentation of an algorithm was made to compute these weights. And this algorithm now is presented. We start by showing the most general settings, a setting. We call it unrestricted classification problems. We also go from two classes, classes to K classes. However, the whole thing works also for the two classes. Multi-layer perceptron does not mean we go to K classes always, but we do this here so to, so to have the most general case. Again, we are looking for the classification function and we approximate this with a multi-layer perceptron. We can solve with such a machinery problems like this. The regression function, here are the values one for the green class, the values zero for the red class. And the regression function here is a yellow plane. And you see that it fits quite well to these points. And the computation of this function is done with the perceptron. And if you look at the intersection of this yellow function with an input space, get this decision boundary.
the main idea to overcome the separability problem was to use differentiable function here, which is not linear. And we use the sigmoid function. You've seen it already in logistic regression. And this is, explains us also why logistic regression is so strong. Some ideas of this approach apply here as well. The function looks like this. And I can skip over this because you know it already very well. Sometimes people apply a similar function. Here you see the time and superbolicus function. But um, in principle, this is not a change. This is a single perceptron. You see the input on the left hand side. The perceptron now is a sigmoid function here. And in fact, you can also think as a logistic regression model here of this. I guess, um, Michael, it's exactly the logistic regression model. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And we can now stack several logistic regression models together. This is called network. And this here is our hidden layer. This is the output layer. This is the input layer. The input layer does nothing. We use it only to distribute the input values to the hidden layer. The computation is done by these weights. The weights here and the weights there. That means in our problems before, the hypothesis were these W vectors. This W vector, the weights here. This now is extended to the two matrices with weights. They play the role of the hypothesis. That means before we had p values to be found, now we have to find these matrices. And you directly see the larger the hidden layer is, the more parameters you get. And the more data you need to estimate these parameters. However, what we gave for, uh, gain for this high price is that we can approximate any function. If you have enough data, you have enough computing power, you can approximate any function. And uh, perhaps you recall in the XOR problem, we had this new feature space. And this is exactly also here. The output of the hidden layer gives us a feature space. There are also networks uh, conceivable with more than one hidden layer, but there is not happening much uh, from this point now. This model which we have provided for you is as nearly as powerful as many others. And the extension to other hidden layers is now very easy in this framework. We hence stick in all our algorithms and computations to exactly this architecture, what you see here. The input space, which is p-dimensional, extended by this here. The hidden layer, which is l-dimensional, extended by this here. And the k-classes. Yes, the k-classes. Mm, if you have k-different classes where value can stem from, we can think of this vector as a so-called, I guess, one hot vector. That means a vector which has for a certain class a certain value. But we can also think of multi-label problems where we want to get things like this. An object belongs to several classes. This is the most general case. Hence, we call it the unrestricted classification problem. It's unrestricted with regard to the model function. It's unrestricted with regard to the classes. A 
it is used as a model function here. How does it work? You take the value x, multiply it with this matrix wh. We call it wh because it's a matrix connected to the hidden layer from the left side. Compute the feature space. This is this here. Add a one. This is this here. And multiply this vector with the WO matrix here. And then again, the sigmoid function here is applied. You see, I've written this bold to show that it's now used in its vectorial form. And this gives our output. That means the model function, which before was the wx, x, x yeah, is now, it's now becoming this. Forward pass computation, also called forward propagation, takes now a value and um, applies these weights, computes the sigmoid function, does the same on this side, and we get the result. There are only two matrix computations involved there. Here's the first step, there's the x, there's the first matrix, this is a feature vector. This then is used here in the second matrix. First propagate, second propagate. And because it's so canonical, I also show you, you can apply this for a single value, but you can also apply this for the entire data set. The structure is simply the same. This is nice if we have these weights. The question now is how to get these weights. This is called in the, um, in the, in the process of backward propagation, is a process uh, which, is, which, uh, which is used for this. And here we do the same like we did in the gradient approach and hence I have recapped this today. We asked for the loss, which now is not the loss only with regard to a single vector, but with regard to these two matrices here. We use the Gaussian or RSS, that means residual sum of squared loss. And um, it's done as follows. For instance, you get values like this here. You compare them to the desired values. Takes a square and you do this over all examples. And this function, this loss function here, of course, has derivatives. But uh, because this function here is so complicated, we cannot give a closed form for this derivative. And hence, we do an approximation of this. We compute the derivative in two steps. We take this difference, which you see here, and consider that part until here as constant, and look what this difference here, I say this delta, can do with this weights. This is the first back propagation step. And the second back propagation step, we do the same with the left part with this matrix. This um, is explained in the next slides. And again, we have shown you the complete mathematics only to show you that it's not a witchcraft behind this and you can compute this for yourself.
but you need not to, to learn this completely in kind of road learning. Again, it is a complicated situation. Look at this function. The loss are the differences between these points and the yellow surface, and you can consider this very complicated function. This function looks like this here. And you see it has several uh, local minima, and um, we now have only a heuristic because it's not a convex function to find the global minima. And this is done within these two steps. And then we compute a gradient from the output layer and a gradient from the hidden layer. The first one is called nabla O. The second one is called nabla H. Nabla is normally the gradient of a function that means the matrix or the vector of all partial derivatives. And if a person gives us indeed these nablas, we can plug them in here in the update function. And I show you now the algorithm. Here's the algorithm. And here you see that the delta is computed and the delta is added to the previous version of the WO matrix. If you do this computation, that means build the partial derivative, you get this expression here. Then with this, you have an expression for this. And with this, you have an expression for the update. And with this, you can do the algorithm. I have done this for nabla O. I have done this for nabla H. That means the other matrix. It's uh, quite canonical. And this leads to these algorithms, which will conclude our multi-layer perceptron reading. We start with a random initialization of our weights. This, this time, the two matrices. We take an example. We do the forward propagation. We get to the feature space, from the feature space to the output space. We compute the differences. We update our matrices, and this is repeated. And I promise you, this is all even in the most complex algorithms that we have in our world today. Of course, you can introduce numerical ideas. You can introduce more layers. But this principle, this is applied. This is incremental gradient descent demonstrated for a two-layer multi-layer perceptron. And I guess with uh, this algorithm, I will conclude the neural network part of this reading. Um, you see uh, some new operators which were introduced to simplify notation. This is this operator, which shows a pointwise product, this whole called Hadamard product. This is a multiplication of two vectors element-wise, a very simple multiplication. And this is this operator, so-called tensor product or dyadic product, which takes a column vector and a row vector 
And if you do matrix multiplication, you get a matrix. It means it's a standard matrix multiplication between these two vectors. However, the first one is a row vector, the second one is a column, the first one is a column vector, the second one is a row vector. And you might have heard the word tensor, and you know the software tensor flow. This is the reason why it's called this way, because this product is needed in propagating these values. I've linked uh, the information that you need to look up. But first, uh, if you never have seen this, it's called the dyadic product, or so-called outer product, or tensor product. And what I've demonstrated here will also form the base of our introduction to deep learning. Okay, thank you very much for listening so careful. I will now hand over to Martin. If there are questions, of course, you're welcome to ask questions. And um, we can also open the microphones if they aren't already open. We have enough time and there are not so many and you're welcome.